Okay, a very good evening, one and all. Welcome to Buddhist Mahavira's Facebook uh, page here at the live sessions that we're having uh, every Friday and every uh, Sunday. Uh, this evening, we have tried something new uh, for the first time. Uh, instead of a, a Bhante giving a Dhamma sermon, uh, we have two Bhantes at the same time simultaneously here in the studio with us, uh, who's actually going to answer your questions. Uh, and they will do this live uh, in a short while. Uh, we have Bhante Sankitche, uh, who's actually from the States, from Michigan in, in the States, but currently he's based in Sri Lanka because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, and we also have Bhante Jinananda, uh, who is in Canada, and he's, he's coming to us live from Canada. Um, we were only expecting a handful of questions, actually, when we first started this program, thinking that, you know, uh, we won't have that many questions. But in the past few days, uh, we were actually inundated with so many Christians uh, that now uh, I've just spoken to the two Bhantes and I think we'll have to extend this uh, to over three sessions. Uh, one session will not do because there are so many questions that our devotees would like answered. So without much ado, I would like to bring on uh, our two invited guests this evening, uh, Bhante Sankitcha and Bhante Jinananda. Good evening, Bhantes. And a good morning to Bante Jinananda. Good evening. Good evening to you, Leslie Tilak. Yeah. Wait. Bante, your, your mic. Yes. Bante, Sorry. Bante Sanchi. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Okay, right. Now we, Sorry. Yes. And we, hear, and we hear the coil at the background as well. <laughs> right. We have all this still. And yeah, we have uh, some special effects in the background. So let me introduce the two monks to you uh, before uh, we start. Um, Bante uh, Y. Sankitcha uh, was born in Kandy, Sri Lanka in 1976. He entered the monastic life at the age of 15 in, uh, in 1991 at the Sri Subodhrama International Monks Training Center in Kandy. Uh, soon after his high ordination in 1996, he moved to Australia where he lived for four years until he moved to the Great Lakes Buddhist Vihara in Michigan, USA in 2001. Bhante Sankitcha received his BA degree in psychology from Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. He also has a master's degree in counseling psychology from the Oakland University in Michigan, USA. And he's currently the abbot of Great Lakes Buddhist Vihara and is engaged in many social and religious services, both locally and internationally. Now, as a meditation and Dhamma teacher, Bhante Sankitcha helps many people, including teens and adults, by providing them with Buddhist spiritual counseling. And now we have Bhante N. Jinananda. Bhante Jinananda Tero is a Sri Lankan Buddhist monk who is currently the chief incumbent monk of the Hilda Jayawardhana Ramaya Buddhist Monastery and Meditation Center in Ottawa, Canada. Bhante has a postgraduate diploma in Buddhist studies from the University of Kalania, Sri Lanka, and also a Bachelor of Education degree from the University of Colombo, and a Master's of Arts from the Wilfrid Laurier University in Canada. Bhante Jinananda is also the Director and Vice President of the Buddhist Congress of Canada. Venerable also conducts, uh, has conducted uh, Samatha and Vipassana meditation retreats and given Dhamma sermon in various parts of the world. He has also provided counseling and spiritual guidance to various Buddhist communities in Canada. So that is the profile of both our monks. Uh, so without much ado, I will now uh, hand the, the stage to our two monks. Uh, Bhante Sankitcha will start the Q&A session. The, this session is, is actually called Ask the Teachers Anything. So we have uh, start with the first question. Uh, I will take Bhante Jinananda off the screen together with myself and leave Bhante Sankitcha to answer the first question. Hello, hi. Uh, hi, everybody. So we are very happy to be with you all uh, in this uh, evening to share the Dhamma with you all. Uh, so we have the first question. Uh, it is mentioned that the Buddha Dhamma is against the stream. Why? by bro david uh, so this is a very common uh, 
concept or idea in the teachings as you can remember you may have learned this thing uh, from various dhamma teachers uh, so why is it said that the buddhism is against the stream so we had to know we had to learn what is the stream in what context uh, this term stream is being used in the teachings uh, one place uh, where it explains the stream as commonly if you can remember uh, we have the term as stream entry right stream entrant uh, is explained as the uh, the very first stage of enlightenment sotapanna right so uh, as we can see this is one stream towards the enlightenment or you may call it the spiritual path spiritual journey so this is one stream so the other stream is uh, what is going away from the enlightenment or the total purification of the mind uh, so these are the two opposite directions as we can see right so uh, the buddhist teachings are against the normal uh, stream uh, what it means is that uh, the how the normal world is functioning right uh, when we come to the very practical dhamma here basically all human beings if we are only talking about the human beings they all are driven by the uh, uh, influence or the control uh, of the five or six senses right uh, so we always we are always led by or controlled by these six senses eyes nose tongue ears the body and the mind itself so this is how uh, we are living in this normal day-to-day -day life right so we always we are always controlled by these uh, urges uh, so we we call them uh, the five senses uh, or five sensual pleasures basically so this is how uh, one stream uh, is functioning in the world so this is uh, not the spiritual path this is not the path to enlightenment so that's why it in the dhamma it is explained the buddhist teachings is against the stream so these uh, two terms are used in the Dhamma clearly, Anusotagami and Patisotagami. Anusotagami means uh, whatever takes it to be in the normal uh, worldly uh, path or worldly stream. So that is the Anusotagami. That means that person is not strive on diligence to practice the Dhamma or follow any spirituality. Uh, that person perhaps has no any spiritual values. Uh, he has no any idea about the spirituality or spiritual path. So that is the uh, anusotagami. So that is towards uh, the world uh, or indulgence in these uh, five senses, right? So that's where uh, people uh, develop all the mental impurities negative conditions that are conducive to suffering we call it the sansara so we can call this common stream as the sansara sansaric journey itself can be identified as uh, uh, the anusotagami that is conducive to travel through this existence if we follow that extreme extreme but uh, the buddha's teachings when buddha came uh, and he became enlightened and realized the four noble truths and became uh, a person who completely uh, liberated himself from the sansaric uh, suffering and uh, attained the supreme bliss of enlightenment uh, nibbanic peace so uh, there he explained uh, the path leading to the cessation of suffering or to the enlightenment is totally different from the normal stream uh, that people usually take right so as we can see the buddhist teachings uh, basically always uh, against the mental impurities right we always talk about the purification of the mind how to get rid of our anger jealousy uh, the attachment for the sensual pleasures as we can see this is uh, the opposite direction uh, that normal people take right so in that context 
uh, it is explained uh, the Buddha's teachings are against the uh, normal stream. Okay, that is the meaning. Uh, but uh, in the Dhamma, it is explained as a different stream uh, when one is uh, enters into the uh, noble or the enlightenment stream. Uh, that's a uh, norm uh, that is far beyond the normal stream. Uh, so that is towards the enlightenment, right? So, uh, so here we can see that uh, idea, that uh, concept, uh, the stream against the stream, uh, anusotagami or patisotagami, the path going against the normal stream, uh, is explained and used in different contexts in the Dhamma. Uh, I think uh, that can be clear. Uh, if you have any questions, we can uh, uh, we can ask. And uh, <clears throat> the second question is: Karma the same as fate? How does karma work? By uh, Sister uh, Gladys, uh, if I read it correct. Uh, so this is also a very common topic in the teachings, right? As we always learn about the karma. So this is uh, one of the unique, uh, unique teachings of the Buddha, the teachings uh, on the karma. Uh, so we, we always get to learn about it in different contexts, in different meanings, uh, in terms of how this karma is affecting us, how we accumulate karmas uh, in different ways, right? Uh, part of the question is, what is the karma? We have to understand. Uh, in the uh, Dhamma, it is explained. Then, Chetanaham Bhikkhavi Kambang Vadami, which is basically for all our intentional actions, physical, verbal, and mental, they are going to be a, a consequence accordingly. Right? So, this is a very basic teaching uh, of the Buddha. So, we learn from very early age uh, this theory of karma that way. Right? Uh, we have to reap what we saw. That is the basic understanding about the theory of karma. Uh, so, uh, one aspect of uh, this karma is that whatever we perform as actions, intentional actions, uh, we cannot simply avoid the consequence of it. We definitely have to uh, reap the consequence. We have to go through the result. So, there's no any escape. As we learn, even enlightened ones, Buddha or any other enlightened beings, even they cannot escape the results of the karma. So this is uh, uh, one uh, Dhamma uh, in the Panchaniyama. Uh, as we learned in the Dhamma, there are uh, different uh, five phenomena in the world, how things happen, uh, including uh, with the human life and this existence. Uh, one of them is the theory of karma, Kammaniyama we call. All right, so it's a very common uh, phenomena that it is not governed by any one supernatural power or agent in the universe but we as individual uh, are responsible for what we are doing uh, how we perform our intentional actions but when we hear the word uh, fate uh, to me it uh, kind it kind of sounds like uh, uh, it's already imposed on us right by someone fate uh, you can see these both terms as similar too. I, I mean, uh, as far as the, the simple meaning, uh, literal meanings are concerned. Uh, but the fate sounds like you cannot control it. You are definitely going to uh, be controlled by the uh, fate, right? But even though I said that we cannot avoid the karma, uh, in the Buddhist teachings, uh, there are ways of controlling our karmas. Uh, that part of the teachings are very interesting. You know, how can we control the karma? Can we get the control over our own karma and uh, reactions to our own karma? There are certain places uh, that Buddha explains uh, how we can control our own karma or the consequences of our own karmas. Basically, no one can even a Buddha or enlightened one cannot avoid uh, major uh, karmic consequences of uh, certain karma, like we call them the pancha anantari karma, 
like killing of a father mother uh, or an enlightened one uh, shedding of the blood of uh, the buddha hmm? and also the sangha bed uh, so to uh, divide the unity of uh, the spiritual community this kind of uh, basic uh, powerful karmas the consequences of them uh, cannot be avoided by anyone no matter who uh, but Uh, for certain minor karmas you can have the control you can uh, control the consequences of them by practicing the dhamma especially uh, by practicing mindfulness wisdom and uh, all the qualities uh, that we learn in the dhamma uh, it is a kind of way to gain uh, even the control of our own karma so that is why we learn in the dhamma by attaining the enlightenment one ends uh, enormous consequences of karma uh, so that is a part of the enlightenment right uh, so the teachings of the karma uh, is very complex there are uh, various of classifications uh, how they are performed as physical mental verbal and how when they are going to be effective to us in this very lifetime right immediately after somebody dies and throughout the existence until we attain the enlightenment uh, things like that uh, so it's a very broad topic uh, it can be a very different one whole dhamma uh, sermon <laughs> so uh, for for now i think uh, this short answer would be sufficient uh, for the question i guess Yes, thank you, Bante. Uh, those are the two questions that we have posed to you. Uh, now we will move on to Bante Jinananda for another two questions, and then we'll bring you back again for the next session. Sure. Welcome, Bante. So then I'll post the two questions to you on the screen. Okay. Thank you very much, Tilak. Uh, for joining we, uh, me with this uh, wonderful discussion. It's nice that I am with Bhante Sankic in the same, same virtual panel. We, uh, the question I got uh, is, uh, it is necessary for us to, is it necessary for us to breathe in and out slowly and deeply as breathing exercise for meditation? Uh, this question uh, is asked by uh, Catherine Laiway. Um, it's a very good question because a lot of people ask this question uh, because of the complexity of the uh, in and out breathing meditation let me uh, bring your attention that uh, the meditation on in and out breathing is the meditation that the buddha developed for his enlightenment and uh, he mentioned it several time in discourses that uh, this is one of the complete uh, menu for enlightenment uh, if i remind rem, remind you that uh, buddha, uh, buddha's advice to venerable rahula and many other monks uh, he said that this is the meditation that the buddha uh, do usually when he is not uh, preaching when he's not uh, going on pindapatha when he's not doing anything else this is the very meditation that he practice in his free time therefore this meditation is deep uh, and uh, there are many aspects of dharma we could have, uh, you know address in this uh, breathing meditation the question is whether we need to breathe in and out slowly and deeply in the meditation in uh, according to this anapana sati sutta in madhyama nikaya the sutta number 118 we do not find such things Uh, that we need to intentionally breathe in deeply or slowly or fast or whatever ways but we have to be mindful let's take the word anapanasati in and out breathing uh, it means that we have to be mindful about the in breath and out breath as they happen uh, however uh, as teachers we also instruct people to take a couple of lungful intentional breathings at the beginning of the meditation because people were not in mindfulness practice before the meditation session in order for them to 
get into the right track we ask uh, you know meditators to take uh, such practices at the very beginning but technically we can say that we have to let the natural breath uh, function uh, as it is then we bring our attention undivided unbroken a mindful attention to the breath and establish there at the nostril or some people advise uh, look at the belly uh, uh, so whatever the place we focus the technically we have to be mindful about the natural breath so that's how the discourse uh, says about the uh, breathing style uh, at the same time i just want to make a note that uh, that the uh, anabana sati or in and out breathing meditation is named like that because we take the subject of meditation breath uh, if you look at the uh, 16 steps of anabana sati right after the four uh, steps at the very beginning we prominently focus not the breath but uh, other mental and physical aspect basically mental aspect rapture pleasure uh, born out of concentration and mindfulness develops there and the concentration develops there so we have to focus these aspect more than the breath because our mind has that capacity when we go forward and look deeply so uh, at the very beginning we focus the breath as it happens uh, and then we move our attention towards physical and mental aspect uh, in the long run so uh, anapana sati is such that uh, we take the breathing as a tool to focus our mind and then we go on to different aspect of our mind so here uh, we need to understand that uh, the meditator on anapana sati uh, should realize the whole picture of the body and mind before uh, they get into meditation then uh, in my understanding uh, we practice mindfulness just before the anapana sati that's why i re- uh, refer to some discourses at the very beginning the maha rahulo vada sutta in majjhima nikaya uh, the buddha said to venerable rahula that you have to practice preparatory meditation to get ready for in and out breathing meditation with that kind of experience you are less you have less uh, hindrances and disturbances and get into the anapana sati to get more results good results in uh, in the meditation so look at the word let me uh, uh, say these two words uh, just for for the clarification uh but they said in the first uh, uh steps of anapana sati digang vas santo digang as samiti pajana it means that the meditator understand uh, i breathe in long and i breathe out long so uh, the word we use pajana it means understanding we do not make any force to the breath but we understand that the breath is going long out long in and when we comes to uh, the short uh, breath it happens naturally if you look at a small child sleeping uh, when the child is sleeping uh, you you may look at the child for couple of uh, minutes maybe 10 or 5 minutes you can see that the child is take a long in breath and long out breath after a while that is because this body needs uh, breathing uh, uh, much more than uh, usual after 5 5 uh, minutes so uh, this this means to us that the breathing happens naturally and we have to focus it uh, uh, and uh, then uh, we can go forward with the develop mindfulness i think according to the time available for one questions i can give this kind of answer so uh, basically we do not need to think about the slow breath deep breath long breath short breath they happens naturally it is the breath, you know the breath is taken by the body for the need 
to circulate the blood to make to make this you know body uh, you know living so it happens in its own way we have to do mindful about the breath as it is so that's the answer that i could give uh, for this question and we do uh, so i am going to the second question now you can see the question uh, it is uh, from it is from uh, miss uh, lai meng fong and mr kill i think the question is if my karma is due to my own act of good and bad how can merits be transferred by by the others and how can these merits affect my karma and vice versa isn't it uh, isn't each being responsible for his or her own karma yeah it's uh, one of the uh, crucial questions to answer uh, because uh, we don't have, we do not have any practical experience of uh, the afterlife but anyway i can give you a very good answer for this uh, yeah without uh, a doubt as bante sangeet also mentioned in his uh, answer to a question uh, the person should re- be responsible about the karma and the karma is the intention so when we do karma things intentionally the results would be for that person without a doubt so we, when we uh, go to the uh, transferring merits and uh, related uh, dharma facts we can say that Uh, as the karma of his own uh, coming or uh, coming from uh, of his own action uh at the death moment and also after life after this life he or she should uh, get all these uh, karmic results then why we transfer merits to departed relatives and why we take so much emphasis on that uh, in the day to day life Uh, we cannot see this uh, scenario at the buddha's time uh, w- there is one c- incident happened to king kosala he saw a, a couple of dreams about uh, various beings and he went to the buddha and reported the matter then the buddha uh, explained the reason why he saw the dream and in that explanation he said that uh, you Uh, had a lot of relatives uh, in the past lives who did not uh, do any good things now they they are uh, they are in uh, ghost realm they are seeking meritorious uh, powers for you, from you to get out of that suffering so then the, the buddha advised king uh, kosala to do dana and other meritorious deed and transfer merits to them as a result they would be okay they would go out of that kind of suffering from that onward we can see that people time by time uh, offer dana and do other meritorious deeds and merits to departed people but uh, we cannot expect that each and every relatives and friends who passed away reborn in ghost realm we do not know only the enlightened buddhas or arhant who uh, have the power to know about the uh, life cycle could be able to tell us where these uh, relatives and friends are uh, reborn this being the case it is good to do dana in the name of parents relatives friends and anyone you like but at the same time we have to understand that transferring merit is not because of everyone needs uh, good uh, you know meritorious powers only one category of ghost could uh, receive our blessings that is called pardattupa jeevi one of the uh, realms that uh, you know beings reborn and they are looking for our help they are looking for our meritorious powers so here uh, there are many places that people that living beings could not get uh, meritorious powers suppose if you are Uh, friends uh, passed away and reborn in uh, human realm they could not uh, get our meritorious powers and even in the divine world as uh, in animal kingdom and then uh, the hell uh, there are such places that uh, those beings could not support with our meritorious powers anyway 
we give merits because it is our practice so uh, you know the the dana or any meritorious deed is not for somebody else benefit according to the buddha teaching it sh- they should be done to clarify our mind to cleanse our mind or to develop sila samadhi and panya or to support for that uh, practice as a result uh, based on our compassionate mind or to develop our compassion we transfer merits to divine being and relatives who passed away uh, the very idea there is our compassion development of our kindness so i think uh, if we understand the karma and how living beings are reborn and pass away and what kind of things are uh, caused for them to reborn in such and such a place we can understand clearly what we should do in transferring merit so uh, in my understanding uh, each person should be responsible for what uh, whatever things uh, they did and that help them to reborn in the, in the places in the sansar if they did not uh, you know attain to any level of enlightenment and the meritorious powers relatives tra- uh, you know transfer would be uh, beneficial or not depending on the place they reborn uh, there would be uh, uh, less chances of receiving merits uh, uh, according to the cycle of birth and death because there is only one place that living beings should reborn if they want to get merits so that's the uh, answer i can give a very long answer for this one but uh, i think uh, we get only 7 6 6 7 minutes for one question so if you have um, more questions about this please write to us or read the suttas like thirokuddha uh, sutta in sutta nipata uh, and also tulakama vibhanga sutta in majjhima nikaya you can get more information about karma thank you thank you bante i know we have put you in a spot because uh, uh, we only allow you about 5 to 6 minutes per question and some of the questions are pretty interesting i know it's a, it's a challenge for you to actually answer a question and i know even bante sankit is having the same problem uh, because some of these topics you actually can give a whole dhamma sermon and here we are trying to squeeze it within 5 minutes so we as far as our listeners are concerned uh, please try to appreciate that the monks are trying to do their best to keep within time so uh, thank you bante jinananda we'll see you in a short while again i'll bring on bante sankit uh, welcome bante uh, you have yeah, two locations i see good to be back <laughs> it's dark out okay I'll, I'll, <laughs> okay now i'll post the next question to you yes yeah i'm just a novice who are who are the devas and how do we learn more about them how can we pray to them by bro david okay so this is also a very common uh, question uh, that uh, many people uh, ask from us you know we have a concern about this uh, idea about the devas right uh, so commonly we call them the gods uh deities angels uh whatever the term you use right so this question is based on uh the buddhist uh, special teachings on uh, different realms of existence right so there are different places that different beings are born according to their performed karmas as we have been explaining now uh, bante jinananda and myself Uh, related to many questions uh, so different beings are born in different places according to their own karmas so the realms are explained as these different unique places for different uh, living beings uh, so in the teachings when buddha uh, attained enlightenment especially he could see how these different beings are born in different planes of existence uh, depending on their own karmas especially with the uh, chatupapada jnana we call uh, buddha had a special skill psychic power to see how different beings are born uh, in the sansaric journey uh, so one of the realms are 
uh, the Deva realms or heavenly abodes, we can call. Uh, so in the Dhamma, uh, there are uh, 31 realms of existence. As we learn, different places, uh, different beings can be born. So we can put every single living being into these uh, categories. You know, so the devas are especially born as a result of uh, performing many, many uh, positive, good, wholesome karmas. Mm -hmm. So they are called the devas. Uh, and uh, how it is explained uh, in many of the sutras, uh, they are heavenly beings uh, having all the sensual pleasures, uh, having no any physical or mental uh, suffering. Uh, it's full of happiness. Uh, it is a heaven. That's why we call it the heaven. Uh, we all want to uh, be born. <laughs> Sometimes as worldly people, <clears throat> uh, really want to be born in those existence and in Buddha's teachings also sometimes Buddha praised uh, these realms of existence because it's a kind of uh, uh, higher or advanced level of this uh, evolutionary process uh, you know uh, because the enlightenment when it is explained as a, a process of uh, evolution uh, so the realm of uh, the devas, divine uh, realms can be a higher level, you know, and also uh, human realm uh, is another advanced level, right? That's why uh, Buddha is born only in the human realm uh, of existence. So, uh, by the way, uh, when we uh, use the word deva, especially according to the Dhamma, uh, I remember actually one of the Bhantes gave you, gave you uh, one particular Dhamma talk on this topic. Uh, what is the concept of Devas in Buddhism, right? As I remember, uh, uh, he also explained uh, there are different Devas uh, explained in the Dhamma. Uh, they are called the Sammuti Deva, uh, Uppatti Deva, and uh, uh, Parishuddha Deva as I remember. So these uh, different devas are, uh, Samuti devas are uh, special individuals who live in this world, but they are to be having uh, a special respect, uh, as you can see, right? So there are many different human beings, people are doing a unique uh, service to the world, community, a uh, lot of uh, charity to the community. So people respect them as gods. You know, they are called the Sammuti Deva. Mm -hmm. And even after they are dead and gone, still uh, we remember them. Still we re uh, respect them. Sometimes you may uh, uh, build a statue on behalf of them, right, in, in their names. So they are called the Sammuti Devas. And the uh, Uppati Devas are the exact uh, divine beings who are born in uh, heavenly realms of existence uh, due to their uh, many many positive good karmas uh, so they are to be uh, having a long lifespan you know they live a long time uh, as a result of these good karmas and uh, some uh, some of the devas are uh, we call them the samya uh, drustika and mitcha drustika some uh, some gods or devas can be uh, like having interest in the Buddhist teachings and some are not. Uh, some are engaged in the positive karmas, you know, still, even though they are born uh, because of their good karmas, uh, having no knowledge about uh, how the theory of karma works, still they can engage in bad and wrong negative actions. So some are, some are the uh, uh, some deva who are performing good karmas, good actions, uh, having a better understanding how they were born because of their own good karmas. So they keep uh, continuing that, uh, that path. So, uh, so some devas even uh, attain enlightenment, like Sotapan, a stream entry level uh, of enlightenment, listening to the Buddhist teachings, like uh, the Sakradeva. Uh, 
the god of uh, heaven uh, so they are the upatti deva the visuddhi devas are the uh, individuals uh, spiritual beings who attain the enlightenment right by mental purification they became the devas they they became uh, highly respected right like buddha or any other enlightened being uh, so they are called the visuddhi deva by purification of the mind uh, they are called the devas okay uh, so the idea of deva uh, is also very complex in the teachings you know there's another category called uh, brahma realm so they are also commonly called the devas uh, you know they are also uh, uh, supernatural beings born in heavenly realms because of their spirituality spiritual practice and uh, uh, so you can uh, we can learn about them especially in the sanyutta nikaya uh, there's a one separate chapter called devata sanyutta you know uh, that part is very interesting many different deities gods came to the buddha with very interesting questions uh, sometimes very deep uh, dhamma questions they were very much interested in buddha's teachings you know uh, so you can learn especially about the devas and uh, how they were related to the buddha sasana uh, in that uh, devata sanyutta in the sanyutta nikaya and uh, how can how can we pray to them uh, as a part of the question uh, so normal human beings uh, like to pray for the gods so that is uh, that is okay but according to the buddhist teachings how we pray to the gods is that we perform good positive wholesome karmas and uh, we share the merits with them mm -hmm. we uh, transfer merits to uh, the devas so those who are interested in these positive blessings they can see us uh, they can watch us and still even they can be part of our good actions and they can receive the blessings from us so that is the best way to uh, respect the divine beings so in the teachings it, it is explained that uh, uh, devas are being very happy uh, um, to see uh, we share the merits with them they can even protect you they can even bless you uh, if you receive the blessings of the devas uh, you are going to be very fortunate according to uh, the buddha's teachings even some places uh, as it explains uh, so best way to uh, do good actions wholesome actions meritorious deeds and uh, transfer them or share the merits with the devas so that would be uh, a sufficient answer to that particular question the next question is that if it is good karma that allows us to live to a ripe old age then why do we suffer geriatric problems due to age by sister uh, pamela jai singh okay so <clears throat> that's a um, an interesting question uh, uh, that is also related to uh, karma somewhat so uh, we always learn that it is a blessing to uh, have a long life right it is uh, a common understanding if we can live long it's a blessing uh, but at the same time uh, we see that many people are going through many problems due to uh, aging right uh, so it's a very common uh, experience common thing that we observe in the world in human life uh, so it is very complex as we can see uh, the question uh, of course we have to uh, have performed good karmas like uh, support living beings you know giving abhedana uh, to um, give freedom to other living beings uh, in many ways and even to support other beings uh, in any possible way uh, you earn some good karmas that allows you to live long uh, so but if you uh, slaughter animals if you kill and harm other living beings uh, it is uh, conducive to uh, have a short life mm -hmm. so it is a blessing actually you know i mean look you can look at it in, uh, in different ways right 
uh, it's uh, up to individuals i think uh, because sometimes uh, we hear people say oh i don't want to live long uh, i just want to die uh, peacefully without going through any uh, geriatric problems you know any physical discomfort uh, or illness but that is not the case right we have to understand the the nature of this uh, human life <clears throat> how this body works right uh, nobody is free from uh, physical problems illness uh, old age and eventually the death right so the buddhist teachings is that uh, we we can live longer uh, that we can practice the dhamma long right uh, for a long time so that is the uh, the purpose of uh, living a long life okay it is a blessing to live a long life uh, but uh, nobody is free from uh, the geriatric problems so this is something related to our own karmas too right not everybody uh, suffers from these geriatric problems mm -hmm. Uh, depending on our own karmas, uh, that is also happening to us. Uh, but nobody can escape it. By nature, uh, we all have to go through that, right? Even the Buddha, can you imagine? So Buddha had to go through these conditions as well, aging, sickness, and eventually uh, he passed away, uh, but attained the enlightenment, right? So we have to understand it as a common nature of this human life, this human body, okay? Uh, so, I don't know that answer uh, is sufficient or satisfactory <laughs> to the question, but that is how I can uh, explain the answer uh, to that particular question. Thank you, Bhante. Not a, not a, not a problem because that's my wife who asked it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good question. Though. So, mm -hmm. Bhante, we'll yeah. come back to you in 10 minutes. Uh, we'll let yeah. Bhante Jinananda now uh, sure. take the screen. Okay. Okay, this is your question. Okay, uh, living in a world powered by social media and materialistic ways, how do young people stay grounded? This question is from Sister Rohini Pereira, USA. Thank you for the question. So we get this kind of question quite often from parents and adults about their children. If I uh, precisely uh, give an answer to this question i think the best answer would be uh, we would be able to keep our children uh, close to people who are happy and peaceful this is the one thing we could do in order to keep our children in the loop uh, it's a challenge i know that because they are in a materialistic way, world with so many uh, devices around and the way of thinking uh, is different from us Therefore, it's not an easy thing. But if we can show them happiness and peace from us practically, they would uh, slowly learn about it. This is actually uh, done by the uh, great disciples for their uh, successors. And by way of showing good qualities by uh, in speech, action, and thoughts, uh, uh, we could be able to take them onto the right track. At the same time, I can uh, add to this that uh, we should allow them to be their own friends with uh, with a limitation like, you know, uh, sometimes we try to control them uh, just because we value our cultural uh, things uh, back from the country. But we have to uh, understand that their mindset is, is different from us. And though they are from our blood, they are different human beings. With this understanding, we just want them to stay in their life but uh, with cautions let them be their own friends so uh, then i can say that uh, it is better for us to help them to find their own happiness by way of dhamma uh, sometimes parents ask them to meditate and go to temple uh, do whatever we do that because you are our children i don't think uh, that doesn't work well in some context because uh, because of their age because of their experience in life and so forth but it is better for us to be friendly for them and uh, show our good qualities um, 
it is okay if we do some uh, interesting things in the dharma like uh, going into a pilgrimage and going into temple not for a long program but for some meditation like mindfulness that works well i have experienced that children like something scientific something rational uh, instead of uh, dragging them to pujas and chanting uh, which usually uh, you know we cannot prove that this is scientific and true but meditation does work so that's one thing we uh, that's another thing we can do and uh, so uh, the other thing is stop doing karma that pu- uh, that push people away from young people you know sometime we think over and try our best to transform them into a framework we shouldn't do that uh, try to be again friend, uh, uh, you know friends of children and uh, young people and try to make uh, them sense about this so that's what uh, the buddha did in his teaching he came across many young people and uh, what he did was showing them uh, the karma uh, or the results of karma and then children uh, yeah, young people can get uh, decisions about it so this is what uh, we need to do uh practice meditation on loving kindness and things like that could be uh, working but uh, we have to uh, think about the nature of children and whether this is suitable for this uh, and and that and that kind of evaluative uh, experience uh, sh- should be there in parents or adults in order to uh, keep our young generation into the right track basically buddha's philosophy is good so instead of putting some religious uh, traditional practices on their head it is better for us to talk uh, to them with uh, scientific philosophical psychological aspect of the dharma then they will understand it so i think uh, according to the time limit uh, this is the answer i can give uh, so we must be realistic uh, about uh, when we deal with the children so the next question is why do bad things happen to good people uh, sister greja de silva from kuala lumpur okay this is a very nice question so uh, i think everything is impermanent because of uh, the impermanence theory related to everything why not bad uh, good people uh, get uh, unfortunate things so uh, i i want to say that uh, we cannot expect things to be under control by being good look at the buddha's life he is the self enlightened buddha and he was attacked by a venerable devadatta and uh, he was accused by some people uh, baselessly and uh, when we look at the life story of venerable moggallana Uh, he he was one of the greatest arhans at the time of the buddha so he was attacked by a gang of thieves unto death and uh, i remember venerable sariputta being the uh, highest in uh, wisdom he was second only to the buddha he was attacked by some people even uh, demons so without uh, you know uh, you know considering uh, the whole picture we cannot say that uh, why good people get uh, uh, bad things you know being good would be because of kalyanamitta qualities here and now because of good uh, society here and now it may be because of good uh, things you did in the past or not or basically uh, being good cannot uh, control everything in our life so when we become good and wholesome our wisdom faculty would be developing more and more to accept everything as there so the wise people when we become wise no matter what happen to us we accept all these things with equanimous mind then we are not going to analyze them as good and bad for wise people they are only occurrences due to causes and condition so the wise people at the end look at the paticca samuppada the dependent coordination in analyzing problem 
so i think uh, things happen for everyone like uh, earthquakes floods and the coronavirus is the great example to show that it, it affects to everyone it has been affecting to everyone in the world with uh, uh, you know irrespective of good and bad uh, behaviors so karma is working in a meticulous way that we cannot understand its whole scope but being good make us happy right now and it is the way for us to gain nibbana and we have to accept the other things uh, around the way and on the way to nibbana so uh, uh, so i think uh, we do not expect too much by being good we have to let go of many things even good things and bad things this way i think we can find a, a, a permanent a perfect solutions to our happiness and peace i think that's the time for the second questions uh, if you have any more questions uh, please uh, write on the live comment i would take into consideration and uh, try to give a, a detailed answer later on Thank you, Bhante. Uh, yes, you know, uh, time's really up, and there's already an hour that we have spent, and you're about only three quarters of the way. We still got a few more questions to go. Uh, now I'd like to invite Bhante San Sankicha back on uh, to the screen. Bhante, this is your question, Bhante. Yes. Uh, what is Pancha Bala Dharma, and how to cultivate them? By Bro Eranga Edrisin from Sri Lanka. Uh, this is very interesting, actually. Uh, what are the pancha bala? Uh, a parallel term would be uh, pancha indriya, uh, if you can remember. Pancha indriya and pancha bala, uh, we learned in the Dhamma as a very special part of the teachings. They are namely called sadha, virya, sati, samadhi, panya. Okay, sadha is uh, confidence. Or the faith you may call it uh, virya is the effort right effort uh, sati is the mindfulness samadhi is the concentration panya is the wisdom so these are called pancha indriya and pancha bala let me explain uh, why these five spiritual faculties we call them the five faculties uh, five spiritual faculties and uh, i would uh, be more than happy to identify them as five spiritual uh, uh, dynamics, right? So there are different dynamics, aerodynamics, biodynamics, things like that. So these five faculties can be the spiritual dynamics. How the spiritual progress, how spiritual development uh, is achieved by cultivating these five faculties that's why they are called the five spiritual faculties why these uh, same five faculties are called the uh, indriyas and balas so these two terms we need to learn how they are explained in the dhamma is that uh, indriya indra the word indra means the chief chief always goes in the front right leads the way that is the duty of the uh, leader, Indra. Bala is a kind of, uh, uh, it is pushing you forward. In that way, uh, they are called the Balas. Uh, so these five uh, spiritual faculties are working in these two unique ways, that they are leading you towards enlightenment and they are pushing you towards the uh, enlightenment. In both ways, uh, that's why they are called the Pancha Indriyas and Pancha Bala. Okay, so uh, it has a very unique uh, way of cultivating. You know, part of the question is uh, asking how to cultivate them. So we can see that there is a sequence in these five spiritual faculties. Okay, uh, how anything is started with your faith with your confidence right when you are to begin something with you have to have a good confidence uh, better uh, faith in it you know uh, it's a very uh, important quality which comes first 
that's why it comes first sadha comes first without sadha without confidence there's no path right uh, that's why it comes first uh, confidence is very important especially to the spiritual path so we have to have confidence in the buddha we have to have confidence in the dhamma and the sangha uh, so this is very unique uh, the very first faculty uh, and whatever you have the confidence upon you put your effort towards it right that's how the second faculty or the second bala comes in play into play right you put your effort to practice uh, follow that direction follow the instructions follow the teachings uh, so that that is the second one and as you uh, maintain that uh, right effort you know it is explained in the dhamma very broadly you know what is the right effort uh, this is not the time to explain it but uh, but when you maintain that right effort you should be maintaining right mindfulness you know this is a mistake that many people are experiencing when they try so hard they lose mindfulness you know it, it becomes very hard for them to stay uh, mindful right so therefore whenever we try hard whenever we put up a, a right effort we should uh, make sure that uh, if we are maintaining the right mindful awareness mm -hmm. so you can directly apply these techniques to the meditation and equally to any endeavor uh, in your life uh, everyday life you know and the other uh, necessary uh, faculty spiritual faculty is the concentration you should be focused uh, not waving here and there you know listening to someone you change your path uh, listen to someone else you change your path not like that uh, you should be uh, grounded uh, you should be well established in uh, your spiritual path so that is the concentration you know you can look at it in uh, different ways you know as it explains in the dhamma as there are so many different levels of concentration as samadhi the jhana levels we call them right it is a necessary faculty uh, more towards enlightenment and then of course we have to have uh, right understanding which is the uh, panya mm -hmm. of course uh, the better uh, right understanding uh, is the pinnacle of this path with the uh, realization of the four noble truths so these are called the five the spiritual faculties uh, as uh, pancha indriya and pancha bala as we can see within these five spiritual dynamics they they are interacting with each other right as we cultivate the uh, sadha the confidence uh, buddha always emphasizes that our faith should always go with the wisdom right understanding otherwise we make mistake we do foolish things right we take the wrong thing as right uh, so uh, we mess up with everything right so therefore these faculties are interacting uh, helping each other uh, you have to see that in your practice you know uh, the faith or the confidence should always uh, be cultivated with the uh, right understanding or the panya and uh, right effort should always go with the uh, mindfulness and concentration uh, effort should not allow you to get distracted or uh, discouraged uh, so that way we can see these spiritual faculties are interacting uh, with each other with each other uh, so we can see that uh, you can look at them how these faculties are cultivated developed within our spiritual practice uh, suppose you are trying to meditate uh, this is the best way to see that directly how these faculties are cultivated within yourself okay uh, suppose uh, if you see that your meditation is not working uh, you can look for any of these uh, spiritual faculties you know what is missing or what is weak what do i have to cultivate more if my faith or confidence is uh, weak or am i not putting right effort to my practice or my if my mind is scattered uh, if my mindfulness is uh, correctly established or my mind is scattered uh, not in the samadhi level right concentrated uh, and uh, on top of all these things 
am I understanding this better? <laughs> what I am doing? What I exactly want in my life, in my practice? You know, right understanding, wisdom eventually. So uh, your spiritual practice directly as a meditator, you can directly see how these things are cultivated. And uh, the important thing is that you, are, you can see how these techniques are, these faculties are used in your everyday life too. Even with the life, uh, normal life uh, endeavors, you can equally apply these faculties into uh, reach any progress. Okay, so that would be a, a short answer to the question. All right, let's move to the next question. What are the steps to take to leave this delusion of existence by Dr. Sarat D. Alves? Uh, okay, so this is a deep question. What are the steps to get rid of the delusion of existence? Uh, so that reminds me of uh, the entire teachings, actually, right? Uh, the main purpose of uh, the Buddha's great teachings is to uh, eventually let go of this uh, delusion of existence. According to the explanations, the teachings, we can see that uh, we suffer in this life, in this circle of birth and death, getting caught up uh, in that vicious circle as a result of uh, this delusion of existence. So let's understand the meaning of the delusion of existence. Uh, what is the delusion of existence? Existence, uh, the term is used in the Dhamma as the Atma, right, the self. The delusion of a self uh, is the delusion of existence. Uh, how it is explained in the Dhamma, especially in the uh, dependent origination by the Buddha, uh, it is explained that uh, living beings are uh, attached to this uh, sensual pleasure, right? Uh, so this is not a time to go through every single step uh, of the Patiti uh, Samuppada, but directly connecting to the question, uh, as living beings are getting attached to these sensual pleasures, right uh, they get attached to attached to it they get attached to uh, sensual pleasures as the tanha okay and when they have the tanha there they get the feeling of an existence or oh, there's somebody who is experiencing all these things who is handling all these things going through all these experiences so this is uh, how it is explained in the dhamma uh, the identification of a self or personalizing this entire process, the body-mind phenomena, you know, the body-mind existence, uh, how this process is functioning, we identify this total process as a self. Mm -hmm. So that is what we call the bhava, mm -hmm. the feeling uh, or having a perception of a self is what we call the, uh, the bhava. This is how we come into existence, right? So this is where the Buddha explains that the whole process of suffering, the mass of suffering is due to that wrong perception of self, the delusion of existence. Okay, this is where it happens. Uh, technically, according to the Dhamma, according to the Paticca Samuppada, and it is directly connected to our existence. Uh, so we have to go into subtle details uh, on this topic and it can be reached, uh, it can be addressed actually by getting into deeper level of the practice, especially what we call the Vipassana, right? Samatha and Vipassana, these both techniques are very important, very essential. Uh, so we cannot neglect any spiritual uh, practices here as Sila, Samadhi, Panya and all these uh, spiritual practices, as we explain, sadha, virya, sati, samadhi, panya, all these uh, spiritual qualities are needed to uh, get into that deeper, subtler level. Okay. And uh, uh, what is the, uh, how to, uh, how to get there? You know, what is the realization? You know, uh, it is the result or the consequence of uh, the panya, the wisdom, the faculty of wisdom allows us to see that reality you know uh, without taking much time i would 
uh, I would uh, like to explain this uh, simple example. You know, uh, how do we see this uh, illusion of existence? Okay. So suppose you take a flashlight. Okay, this is a very common example I give to explain this uh, deep question. Uh, you you take a flashlight. Uh, you light the flashlight and you get that flashlight to spin very rapidly. You know, you you move that flashlight very fast in a circle. Okay, so what would you see when you keep spinning that uh, flashlight? What would you see eventually? So definitely you are going to see a circle of light, right? Circle of light. But if I ask a question from you, is there a circle in reality there? Is there a circle uh, of light there? So you may have different answers, uh, right? So somebody would say there's no circle, there's a circle, so different answers, okay? Uh, but when you uh, are to understand what do you see there uh, as a uh, circle of light, the inter interesting question is that what created that circle? What created that circle of light? Okay. So in reality, you would say that there's no circle, uh, right? But what created the circle is the rapid motion. The rapid movement of the flashlight itself created that circle and it became an illusion, right? Because we see that very different lots of simple dots of lights connecting to each other created that uh, one single circle. But in reality, there's no circle. It is an illusion. It is an optical illusion that we don't have the ability to see uh, different spots of uh, the circle so that illusion itself created the circle for us mm -hmm. so you interact with that circle accordingly you know how we interpret that how you understand how you perceive that circle but to prove that there's no circle what what can you do what steps you can take mm -hmm. you may have different answers to that question too but the ultimate solution would be you have to stop the motion of the light or you have to slow it down, right? And then, only then you begin to see that ah, there's, there's different dots of lights. There's no circle anymore. Ah? Ah, that's what you begin to see. Either you completely stop the motion or you slow the process down. Mm? And then you begin to see that there's no circle. It was an illusion. So this is exactly what... Uh, happens in the delusion of existence. So when we uh, move rapidly, you know, we, when we rapidly move uh, around this world within this psychophysical entity and as we communicated with this external world through our sensual, uh, sen uh, sense faculties, uh, this is how we process everything within our brain, our nervous system, our neurons, uh, physical uh, chemistry and everything, uh, this is how we perceive the world. It is such a rapid movement, ra rapid motion if you are to understand. There's no any way to even measure, even though the science is so uh, developed today. There's no way to even measure how rapidly these uh, senses are processing these signals in our system, right? So this is how we begin to see there's a self. Just like the motion of the flashlight created the light circle. We, we feel that naturally, oh, there's somebody, there's someone who is handling all these things, commanding us to do this and that, right? Uh, but to see that, uh, you have to do the same thing. You have to do the same process uh, to see that there's no reality. What do you have to do? Either you have to completely stop the motion or you have to slow the process down. And this is what exactly what we do with the meditation, right? You can clearly connect uh, this simple analogy uh, to your practice. What we begin to see then when we go into deeper, subtler level of this psychophysical reality existence, 
uh, with the deep analysis of vipassana we get to know that oh everything is connected that everything is due to the presence of necessary conditions right having no any permanent existence or being involved everything is happening as a uh, causality causes and effects so this is where our deep practice is going to end uh, eliminating the ignorance of existence delusion of existence and uh, uh, that is exactly ends the spiritual path it is the eventual result of the spiritual path when you begin to see that there's no person uh, being involved here uh, that is the end of suffering because we suffer in our life because of that self uh, notion or the feeling of a self or uh, personalizing this body and mind the five aggregates right and then it becomes the pancha upadana uh, so that is the uh, process of suffering okay so uh, this is how we can explain about the delusion of existence and how it is uh, eliminated uh, according to the practice so basically we can say that the buddhas recommended every single step as sila samadhi panya sadha virya sati samadhi panya and the uh, seven uh, factors of enlightenment all these necessary uh, qualities are helpful to uh, complete that journey to reach that complete understanding of the delusion of existence okay i hope you understood uh, the answer uh, i tried my best to explain it uh, briefly <laughs> thank, thank you bhante yes i think uh, you are really uh, absorbed into answering that question and it took up a lot of our time as well <laughs> uh, but right. i think i hope dr sarat uh, uh, was able to comprehend and uh, appreciated that answer by bhante sankitcha uh, we have to move on we have the last three questions uh, i would now like to hand the uh, question to bhante uh, jinananda so the question is can you please explain the term magga phala and how does one realize magga phala is it done through meditation this is from brother jerry lim there are three questions in one uh, you know big questions uh, term magga phala i think uh, we could hear we, we could hear that word magga phala in bhante sankhya's uh, explanation too magga is different from phala so uh, the one who started the training with moral principles uh, practiced the dhamma uh, in into the state of sothapanna then we can see that that one path for uh, enlightenment so we uh, so we can see the uh, magga or the path spiritual path from such level to a level where one attains to sotapanna then we can see uh, you know the the, the, the second uh, path pra uh, practice uh, from sotapanna level to uh, sakuddhagami the the, uh, the once returner so like that there are four magga uh, spiritual path four uh, number of four phala or fruition in that we have eight uh, magga phala uh, let me elaborate that a little bit further then you can understand it well uh, we have four spiritual path practices and four fruitions so uh, that is magga phala uh, the arahanthood the, the full enlightenment is included into that and sotapanna the stream winner Uh, sakurdagami once returner anagami non uh, non returner and also the full enlightened person are included and in between we can uh, paths for different stages so uh, how does one realize magga phala which is a very good question uh, we can understand where we are in the training by looking at our mind uh, it doesn't mean that uh, we have attained to enlightenment yet but if we feel that we are self controlled and we are not satisfied with the sense six sensory experiences as before 
that's a kind of confirmation that we have some restraint on six senses. The first step of this noble training is, uh, you know, the sense, sense, uh, sense restraint uh, developed through right understanding. So then you are not being able to uh, enjoy the uh, sensual pleasures as before. Look at the story of uh, Venerable Sarbut and Moggallana. Well, before they uh, became a, a student of Sanjay and the Buddha, they, they attended to a concert on, on a mountain top and they were fed up, they fed up with the sensual places. That's the time they uh, turned their uh, lifestyle into spiritual path. So when you, you can realize where you are when you feel that kind of experiences. So Maggapala should be known by the very practitioner. And if there are teachers who are able to read others' mind, students' mind, they could, of course, pursue that. But basically, we can feel it. We can understand that we are uh, actually uh, uh, in, a, in a path or practice. So uh, let me tell you two more uh, uh, discourses that you could refer to. One section is called Okkanti Sangyuta in Sangyuta Nikaya. Uh, Chakushutta, the I. It's a very small discourse, but it gives a very nice answer to this question. The Buddha said there that if we are able to understand the impermanence and perishable nature and change in nature of our six senses and six sensory experiences, we would be able to uh, either be in either on the path to Sotapanna uh, and uh, in different levels. Uh, and we do not die without attaining to Sotapan. So once again, if we contemplate on our six senses and six sensory experiences as impermanence and changing or otherwise, we would be able to attain Sotapan at least to the first stage of enlightenment in this very life. So we can do that. And uh, is it done through meditation, which is a very good question. First, I just want you to read this discourse, Silavanta Sutta in uh, Sangita Nikaya. Uh, it is said, uh, it is a dialogue between Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Kottita. In that discourse, Venerable Kottita asked the question from Venerable Sariputta uh, like this for, for the one who completes the training principle, what should be done to go forward? Venerable Sariputta said that that individual should focus the five aggregates of clinging as impermanent, unsatisfactory, non-self with appropriate attention, yoniso manasikara. Simply, it means that uh, the one who has uh, completed the training principles should focus the mind towards himself, the five aggregates of clinging, form, feeling, perception, mental formation, and consciousness as impermanent, unsatisfactory, non-self and, and empty and so on. Then he could attain to Sotapanna, Venerable Sariputta said. Then the question is coming after that, uh, what should uh, that Sotapanna or the stream enter, uh, uh, you know, should do uh, to attain the next level of enlightenment? And the Venerable Sariputta's answer is same as before. He said that focus the five aggregates of clinging as impermanent, unsatisfactory, and non-self. And there are other ways, of course, but I just mentioned only three characteristics. So then he could attain to anagami. Likewise, Venerable Sariputta said that to attain to each stages of enlightenment, everyone has to do the same thing, focus the five aggregates of clinging. Instead of telling meditation, bhavana, Venerable Sariputta clearly mentioned that mental cultivation through reflection uh, and uh, we should make sure that we have to see the impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and non-self here in this reflection. So bhavana again is a very big word and the very word bhavana could be used for the whole teaching of the Buddha. It is not only the sitting meditation. It means that all kind of postures and all kind of behaviors with the right understanding. If there are right understanding, right reflection, appropriate attention, consciousness is there, it is a meditation. 
even during this Dhamma discussion, we have a meditation because we let our mind to develop on Sila, Samadhi and Panya. So friends, uh, uh, if you mean that meditation is uh, only in the sitting posture, it is not what the Buddha means. The, with the word meditation, Buddha means the cultivation of mind on Sila, Samadhi and Panya to destroy uh, greed, hatred and delusion. So that would be the short answer I could give now. Read the Silavanta Sutta in the Sangyutta Nikaya. The next question is with reference to the Agganya Sutta, how were human born looking differently? Skin color, features uh, were not they, uh, they all supposed to look the same. Sister uh, Nalin Jenis. I think uh, this is a very interesting question. So I was asking this question uh, at my young age uh, because of some reason, and I found the answer from discourse, especially Chula Kama Vibhanga Sutta in Madhya Nikaya, Sutta number 135. If you look at the Agganya Sutta, we can see that the Buddha is clearly mentioning the causal uh, sequences of how human beings turn into greed hatred and ignorance. Earlier they were not like that, but due to causes and conditions, uh, people uh, became um, uh, deluded, uh, more, uh, you, know, uh, you know, cruel uh, because of the craving. So due to the, uh, due to such behaviors uh, and also social contest, uh, people are to recognize differently. If we, uh, I think the, uh, the, the uh, um, Nalin Jenis has read the uh, Agganya Sutta and, and others would read the Agganya Sutta as well. So you can see why and which phase of life uh, the kingship came into exist and all these caste system in India uh, came into exist and today we can see white people, black people, Asian, and uh, tall people, flat, fat people, thin people. So that is because of karma in a way. And also the, when we say karma, it is not something we brought uh, into this life from previous life. Even now we are doing karma. Karma is intention as mentioned earlier. So depending on the karma, depending on the nature, the world we live, and the climate changes and changes in the atmosphere, uh, differences of the appearance of people could be uh, uh, a true uh, reality. So uh, in my answer, I can say that uh, if we are able to keep our mind clean and clear, many things could be solved. And even uh, maybe in the future, you know, it doesn't mean that that we have a guarantee that we could get everything sold out uh, right now. But we can make sure that things could be better in the future if we cleanse our mind. Uh, so that is what Agganya Sutta uh, said at the end. And also Chula Kamibang Sutta in Majjhimanika 135 clearly said that some people are beautiful because they practice loving kindness in previous lives. So they are reborn with uh, complex, uh, nice and beautiful complexion. And those who are ugly, uh, because of their uh, anger and uh, quick temper and uh, ill will in their mind in previous life. And why, uh, you know, why human beings die well before they live life or whole lifespan with the in Chula Kami Sutta said that they kill living beings intentionally in previous life. As a result, they die. Why reason uh, uh, before they uh, live lifespan? And why people are so wise at the very early stage of their life? Because they were doing so many good things in their life. And those who are not, didn't do much on that. So there are, uh, you know, uh, 14 questions uh, put forward for the Buddha by, uh, uh, you know, uh, by a person in the Chulla Kamibanga Sutta and Buddha gave answers to those questions. I urge you to read Chulla Kamibanga Sutta for some answers uh, with regard to this question. 
so uh, uh, so do not expect that everyone becomes the same because uh, biologically things are different and uh, by way of thinking we are different even the enlightened beings did not uh, have that kind of uh, same things in their life so uh, do not expect such things because so we just uh, want to make sure our enlightenment and the physical appearance uh, is not a matter for enlightenment so i think uh, that's the time available for the second questions uh, so thank you bante uh for answering those two questions to i think it's nalani janis and uh, brother jerry lim uh Looks like we've lost uh, Bante Sankita for a while. I was supposed to bring him back. But there's one last question. Ah, his Bante is back. Uh, there's this last question. I think that both the Bantes can actually help answer this question. Okay, so I take the... Uh, but is Bante Sankita is going to answer these questions first? Or oh, while he's... Uh, okay, you want to go first, oh, Bante? <laughs> <laughs> you better go first. Okay, uh, so let's see. Why do Buddhists chant and pray? Why pujas? I thought Buddhism is a practice to be applied in our day-to-day -day lives. Okay, uh, so this is a very common uh, general question. Uh, that somehow reminds me of actually the Buddha's uh, gradual path. Mm -hmm. You know, we all enter to the Buddha's teachings, Buddha Sasana, at different times of our life, at different levels of our wisdom, understanding, our reasoning. Uh, if you think about the faculties that we explained earlier, right? Sadha, Virya, Satisabhadi, Panya. We all are having these faculties in very different levels, okay? So when you look at the question, uh, so where these parts uh, fall into uh, under these five faculties, mostly we can connect the, uh, these things, you know, pujas, prayers, chanting, uh, mostly to the first uh, faculty, right? Sadha, the confidence. This is where people develop uh, this confidence in the Buddha's teachings. I'll, I'll take my personal life experience, right? As uh, we were born in a Buddhist country, we grew up in a Buddhist society. Uh, from our early age, uh, we, we did all these things, right? We used to go to temple every day. We did the chanting. Uh, we helped the temple clean and we did everything, right? So. I see that how I developed that confidence, how got, I got closer to the Buddha, his teachings. Uh, so this is very unique thing as I see, as far as the gradual training, gradual uh, path is concerned, right? Uh, not everybody get into the Dhamma with perfect understanding, perfect knowledge, right? It has to be uh, reached uh, step by step. So therefore, uh, different people are in different places uh, in their spiritual journey so they all need these different parts of the teachings you know so those part, those parts can be helpful to uh, some audiences right so different people seek for blessings uh, some relief from from the teachings you know they need the blessings uh, and uh, we uh, we should not forget that buddhism is not only that that is the important thing to remember right uh, if we stop right at the chanting pujas prayers and everything we would not get the essence of the buddha's teachings right uh, as you can see as monks even though we practice the dhamma samatha vipassana we preach the dhamma and everything we do everything right Bhante? we do the chanting we do prayers uh, we still find the harmony in uh, these uh, practices right this is the marvel of the dhamma uh, you don't uh, criticize them, you don't uh, uh, devalue them, uh, but you find the essence of them. How these things can be helpful to us even to continue, move forward in this journey. 
So uh, this is very important. You know, I want to remember, uh, remind you that, you know, whenever people begin to uh, talk about the deep Dhamma, uh, when they begin to especially practice meditation, many people criticize some people are chanting, uh, praying, you know, offering flowers, foods to the Buddha. So these things, it's not a sign of the wisdom, right? So we have to be aware of the gradual path. So some people are in the beginning level. They need them, right? Uh, so no matter what, uh, what we do and where we are, we have to appreciate what they are doing. So this is how they approach the Dhamma. They are still in that level. So we have to be very compassionate to them. Uh, we have to uh, be very patient with that. Okay? Uh, so that's what I can say to that question. Bante can yeah, that's, go uh, that's a very good answer, Bante. Uh, yes, uh, as you said, I can add some things. Uh, even behind me, you can see flowers and the Buddha statue. We do worship the Buddha every day, couple of times. We do that kind of thing just to get into the right practice. It's a kind of uh, a means to us to be uh, reminded ourselves that we should practice Sila Samadhi and Panya. My mind goes to uh, a particular this incident uh, happened at the time of the Buddha. One of the person came to the Buddha. His name was Moggallana. He was an accountant. So he, he told the Buddha that uh, I... I'm an accountant and I used to practice new people by counting one, two, three, four, five. That's how I train people. Buddha said to Moggalla, in my teaching, I do the same thing. I do not teach people, some people, uh, the whole set of teachings, uh, as I discovered, I asked them to clean the ground and uh, put the water uh, and uh, where are the robes and if they became monks and then uh, try to walk mindfully. These are the, uh, these are some of the small steps I teach them for months and uh, until they get ready for meditation. So Buddha himself said that this is a gradual, uh, you know, you know, training principle. There are gradual path practices and the wisdom could be developed gradually. So, Buddha himself indicated that many people in the world should uh, hang on to some type of practices mindfully with wisdom as Bhante explained. Then only they, they could understand the significance of the Dhamma. For example, if, if we are going to teach children the formulas, theories of maths and science, it doesn't work. We have to teach them very basic uh, Things such as the alphabet and how to recognize their parents, how to speak two, three words. So that's how we do with the children. So when they grow old and uh, you know develop themselves in order to un understand concepts, we talk about the uh, deep things. So the practices praying and chanting would be good for those who especially, especially, especially Sorry, uh, and uh, even the monks and nuns who have been taking the practice into highest extent do it because uh, that also brings joy and happiness. In Vimukta Aitana Sutta, Buddha clearly said that some people can attain enlightenment by listening to chanting because during the chanting we can concentrate well to the mind and also the chanting the, and then it's a pathway to go into the meaning of the chanting so that we could develop all kinds of spiritual faculties. So I think uh, uh, even meditation, uh, if we do it for some minor interior purposes, it doesn't work. But uh, for a wise person, chanting and praying could be a, a very intensive meditation experience. So it depends on how we take them. So uh, that's what I wanted to share according to the time. As Bhante Sankicha mentioned, developing Sraddha uh, with this kind of praying and chanting would be crucial for our practice. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, I saw some of the uh, questions put forward in the live comments. I, I think... Uh, Ilatan, I was asking some questions. They are deep, actually. She, uh, 
uh, and that person was asking the questions uh, about how to keep his memory uh, by, uh, with the suttas uh, while he is listening to dhamma sometime uh, after listening to dhamma talks he could not uh, which I, uh, that person could not uh, remember the you know suttas that kind of, uh, that kind of questions were there and uh, some of the question but i think uh, i do not know whether we have uh, time to uh, ask question yeah i used to listen to dharma talks and sutta despite the fact that i understand the content of the dharma talks i tend to forget the teaching after the talk as a result i have difficulty to retain in info information of what i learned this advice how to overcome this i i say a few words uh, just uh, keep some uh, salient statement of the buddha in each discourses not everything just cut and clear some important statement and write it down that's how i do i i write them down in piece of papers maybe in the in my mobile phone so i i let myself to see them over and over again and uh, then i can remember so when i talk to somebody i keep thinking on that i have that practice and when i listen to the those statement of the discourses come into my mind and i can easily match with the sermons i listen to so that's one thing i do i think uh, we could hear from bante sankich too about that well uh, yeah as we listen to the dhamma uh, we should maintain the mindfulness right we should listen to the dhamma mindfully and uh, as a part of that uh, before we completely realize or digest the uh, dhamma talk uh, keeping some information as bante mentioned you know special points in our mind uh, for later use you know from uh, at other times you can bring them into the present moment and reflect on them wisely or sometimes you can analyze it or you sometimes uh, you may see these dhamma in your practical life right uh, so don't worry you may not you don't have to completely understand the entire teachings in a given dhamma talk right there but uh, try to stay mindful and uh, many people forget the dhamma talks actually because they are not present even though physically they are uh, their mind the mentality is not completely there right so still it is possible to forget the entire teachings but whatever uh, hits you you know whatever you find interesting and meaningful and helpful to you uh, try to remember that uh, try to grab something for later use right but especially if you maintain the right mindfulness attentive awareness as you listen to the dhamma it can be very helpful for you to understand the dhamma right there you know so it takes time right so we have to be patient we we need to give some time to us uh, but uh, do not be discouraged right okay thank you bante i think uh, we have come to the end of this evening session 1 we have taken almost 1 hour 45 minutes uh, sorry 1 hour 50 minutes uh, <laughs> that's a long time i think we were only planning to do this for 1 hour 15 minutes uh, the fact that I think I see the way both the Bantes uh, uh, were answering the questions with so much enthusiasm and was totally absorbed in the answers. I think I, it just goes to show that, you know, um, uh, this makes for interesting uh, listening, uh, not just for the listener, but also uh, interesting for the speakers as well. Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, because we have so many questions uh, that still left unanswered, we probably have to do this in session two and session three in the near future and i look forward to seeing bante jinananda and bante sankiche again to for those sessions so before we end uh, this evening uh, let me take this opportunity to thank our sponsors and also to both our bantes uh, bante sankiche and bante jinananda for sparing time this evening and bante jinananda for sparing his time this morning uh, in canada uh, to be with us uh, so before we end, we would like to transfer the merits to the devas and also to the daily departed uh, beings. Uh, Bante Jinananda, Jinananda, would you like to do that, please? Yeah, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. And on behalf of Venerable Sankhicha, one of my uh, teachers actually, 
uh, I would like to uh, thank everyone for uh, organizing, especially Tilak uh, and also the uh, members of the Buddhist Mahavihara in Malaysia. May you all have these merits uh, for your journey into Nirvana. And we would like to mention the name of the sponsor of today's uh, virtual Dhamma discussion, that is, uh, uh, that is uh, Tim King Land. Uh, uh, you accrue so much merits by spon sponsoring this virtual Dhamma discussion. Uh, myself and Bhante Sankic and everyone transfer merits to you and your family. May you be well, happy and peaceful. We first uh, transfer blessings to departed relatives, uh, any relatives who passed away from uh, team family and uh, all uh, those who uh, join with us, may they uh, may their loved ones receive these blessings. May they be well, happy, and peaceful. May they be at, may they be able to attain nibbana by the power of these merits. With this wholesome thought in mind, let's recite the stanza to transfer merits to departed relatives. <clears throat> Idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita hun tu nyatayo. Idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita hun tu nyatayo. And the divine beings who are wholesome receive these blessings and may they be able to cultivate their Dharma for their Nibbana. In return, uh, may they protect all these good people who sponsored this event and who organized this event and also the Venerable Bhante and all those who participate in this uh, event. And we wish uh, further that the divine being help the human world to be away from the coronavirus and all those who are affected, may they have blessings from the divine being to get cured from coronavirus. We, uh, with this wholesome thought in mind, Let's transfer merits to the uh, divine being. May they be well, happy, and peaceful. May they attain Nippon. Ittavata cha amhehi sambatang punya sampadang sabbe deva anumudang tu sabba sampatti siddhiya. Ittavata cha amhehi sambatang punya sampadang Sabbe bhuta anudang tu sabbe sampatti siddhiya. Ittavata cha amhehi sambe tang punya sampadang. Sabbe satta anumudang tu sabbe sampatti siddhiya. Finally, we, uh, myself and Bhante Sankicca, bless each and everyone. May you all uh, be well, happy, and peaceful. May you be able to practice Sila Samadhi and Panya and make sure you're enlightened in this very life. Our special thanks goes to Leslie Tilak and the uh, committee of uh, Buddhist Mahavihar who uh, did various things to make their members enlightened on the Dhamma. May you be well, happy, and peaceful. Thank you very much for listening and thank you for the uh, for the questions we try our best to answer the questions in the next session thank you thank you Bhante. thank you very much so we'll see you soon uh, to all our listeners uh, have a pleasant evening and we will see you on sunday for the next uh, dhamma talk by Bharat, uh, good night good night good night good night, good night. Bhante, good night.